good remembering. Um, I guess, but but or uh, yeah. Um, are you gonna talk at all about the boot camp? No, well, no, there's no slides for it. I wasn't intended to, but okay. Well, then I'll say real fast. Um, FYI, um, we've nailed down details for the boot camp. So if you go to the website and look at the events page, there should be a link to the boot camp event. Um, so we're I guess um, relevant to Matt, um, if there's anybody from AMD that's interested in attending, um, we will be accepting professional um, attendees. Um, and then the dates are all there and we don't have registration up yet, but we will in the next few weeks. Um, as far as students go, um, for US students, well, definitely for US students, maybe for People outside the U.S. We're, we'll be offering travel grants. Um, so, David, you should let, especially the more junior people know around you that uh, this is a possibility. Okay, good. Okay, should I just get started? Yep. Okay, yeah. Um, as previously mentioned, uh, we don't we didn't go into this week with a lot to talk about, but I think just for general getting this kind of out in the Ether, I'm going to go over kind of what we've been working on the Gen 5 resources side, and it kind of broke us up into kind of I call it workload suites and disk images. But I don't think there's a lot out there on this yet. And I guess uh, I'm just here to yeah, push it out there. And if anyone's got any questions or solicit any feedback, be appreciated. But this is what we're kind of working on at UC Davis. And um, yeah, I'll kind of go over things and kind of our general ideas and how we're going to flesh things out over the next couple of Gen 5 releases. and. Uh, Kind of basically over the next year so uh i think this is like the key kind of diagram to keep in mind when you talk about suites and workloads uh it's kind of our way of organizing uh jam5 resources so jam5 resources disk images uh, binaries kind of things like that that we store on our uh cloud bucket and you can automatically obtain inside uh a simulation or you can create your own custom images just kind of uh I kind of think about it mostly as kind of a software hardware kind of split. The, you have your Gen 5 simulation, which is your, uh, the, 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 like simulates the hardware and the Gen 5 resources is like the software you load into your simulation. Um, uh, we found over time that uh, we, we wanted to bundle resources into workloads and a workload is like a run. So a, work, a workload would be like running the a particular application inside the NAS parallel benchmark suite with a particular input size using a particular uh, checkpoint. That would be a workload. It's just a run of Gen 5, uh, a particular input into your simulated hardware. And then we have this grander idea of a suite. So a suite is a collection of workloads. Uh, and really, uh, I think that almost entirely the suites are basically you can think of as uh, benchmark suites. So again, we have our like NAS parallel benchmark suite and that will contain all the NAS parallel benchmark workloads and inside the workloads, all the resources needed for that particular workload. So it's a way of kind of creating a, tr a, a tree. I get, is it ever a graph or anything more than that? Oh, I, I, you, you, can, you can conceptualize it as a tree of how to organize Gen 5 resources. And I'll go over a bit in the coming slides how you would use that in your simulation and then why, why we think it's useful and what we're kind of doing to give more tooling to make it even more useful. So let's go over like the workloads, defining what, uh, uh, what is run. So for example, you've got a very specific kind of run you want to do. I use this example here. You need to specify your disk image. Okay, you want a NAS parallel benchmark suite compiled to x86 and Ubuntu to, 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 to 2204 OS, you want a specific kernel, say so Linux 5.4, compiled to x86. You want to load to a specific checkpoint. Okay, you have this checkpoint resource, checkpoint compatible with the kernel disk image combination, loading, lo loading the simulation to say just after the OS boot. And then you've also this input command for this one once everything's booted. And say so you want to run the BT application with the large input size. That'd be it. And this is all encapsulated inside the workload. So instead of the user having to specify every single one of these uh, four things, uh, which is kind of error prone and very, uh, you mean, you, for instance, the checkpoint resource is only compatible with that kernel disk image combination. So there's a lot of coupling there. Uh, instead of having to specify every single one of these things, you just get it as 
a workload and inside your simulation you specify okay i want this workload it'll be something like i want workload and uh mpb bt large x86 and then it'll just download all the resources needed to see there's um three three like resources there that need to be downloaded and into your simulation and then used and run and the nice thing with this is it's kind of like simulated hardware agnostic it doesn't matter what you're really simulating it will just load it in and you know you can and then that means this workload can be used as kind of like a, a portable standardized way to run this benchmark suite and uh you know you can guarantee it's using the same resource every time and suites uh a set of workloads e.g a benchmark suite the entire nas Palo benchmark suite for example and uh, we're kind of fleshing that out. I think we have one or two examples currently up, uh, but we're definitely fleshing out. But for instance, the entirety of the National Parallel Management Suite. And I'm going to go over in the next couple of slides why this is kind of useful. It's not just like a, a categorization. You can also utilize these in your experiments. One kind of side note here is uh, we introduce kind of labeling of workloads inside a suite. We call them input groups. So for instance, you have the entire suite of NARF parallel benchmark suite workloads, which if you think of the cross product of input size and application is actually quite large. Uh, you know, and you definitely don't want to run every single one. You don't want to run all the applications of every single possible input size. Uh, you probably want to say, I want to run all the NARF parallel benchmark suites with the small input size, for example. So we this uh I think we avoided, for some reason, we avoided the use of the word tag here because I think we use that elsewhere in Gen5 resources. I think we use the term input groups, but you can think of it as tagging or labeling. And um, for instance, every single workload which uses a small input size, we label as small. Everyone that uses large labels large, and there's various other ones. Uh, I think there's a label for every uh, application. I think there's a label for a couple other things. And um, inside your configuration script, you can say things like, for workload in suite dot with input graph small, which is saying, okay, for this suite, give me all the workloads that use small input sizes, and you can iterate through them. The suite isn't iteratable in Python, and also with input group returns a suite. So uh, you can kind of continue to iterate through like this. Uh, there's some typos here, but uh, you can get the general gist. Just here, uh, okay, so why is this useful? Why would you ever want to iterate through a suite of workloads well, it's really powerful because we're kind of working on this kind of multi-processing thing in Gen5 that we're really trying to flesh out. Uh, if you kind of dive into the source code in the last release of Gen5, version 23.1, you can see we've kind of got code that allows us to do this, but it's not very well integrated. And we're kind of working on this integration. And what we're kind of goal is here that from a single Gen5 configuration script, you can launch multiple sub-processes that run different workloads. So like, yeah, so from a, so that means you can kind of encapsulate your entire experimental run for a particular hardware configuration uh, inside a single, single, single configuration script. So for example, you want to run the entire spec benchmark suite on your configuration. Well, this multi-processing functionality will mean that uh, you can run, you know, a, a Gem5, multiple uh, processes of Gem5 in parallel each one in the same hardware, the hardware simulation running a different benchmark application. Uh, again, uh, going back to the kind of uh, input group slash tagging slash labeling thing before, uh, you could also just uh, specify, okay, just run all the small ones. So it'd run a, each process would do every single workload inside that is tagged as small. Uh, and uh, I won't go in too much into this, but just kind of worth noting, uh, this kind of also feeds back into our idea of having a kind of Gen5 orchestration framework where we can kind of manage these sub-processes and Gen5 processes in a more organized way. Uh, we kind of want to get away from, in Gen5, the, uh, I would say, running experiments via a giant bash script that just executes multiple Gen5 threads and they all become incredibly unmanageable over time. Uh, so with this, we want to get kind of get more uh, manageable experimental procedures in Gen5. And also just uh, utilizing um, kind of multiple Gen5 processes as well. So, you know, you can run stuff in parallel more easily. Uh, I have a question on that. Was there? Um, I have a question on that. Is, sure. is it just launching it on the host machine or is it, or do you plan to support like batch servers? Right now, just the host machine. I have 
I haven't thought about, I haven't thought that far ahead yet. Uh, I don't know what and I don't know what would be required to make that possible. I like the idea though, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think whatever the whatever um, uh, interfaces that we design, I think we need to make sure to design those interfaces so that they support both Python multiprocessing and also um, batch submission systems. I think that's important. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I I don't really know much about batch processing systems and whether there is any sort of standardized API for them, uh, but. Yeah, I like the idea. Uh, for now, I think because our first iteration of this will be post machine multi processing, and then from that, uh, kind of bigger batch systems. Okay, uh, I, I I have a question, Matt. Yeah. Uh, uh, so for your batch processing system, do you share a file system? Yeah. Um, okay. And so, the batch command is usually you just prefix something before. Um, the gem five command. So it would be maybe straightforward. I'm not too familiar with the multiprocessing package, but if it's anything like, um, uh, I forget what it's called now, but you know, essentially a thing that runs just a command, you could prefix it with some batch command. Yeah. Um, I, I think the, I, I think launching things is super easy. I think the more difficult one and why I was kind of asking about the file system is one of the really important things I think for this is to have monitoring so that you know when things die, when things succeed, and also have a like an idea of how far your jobs are into their execution. Um, and so figuring that out on a batch system is a little bit more complicated than on the host. But if we share a file system, then we can use the file system for communication there. Yep, yep mm -hmm. that's definitely a challenge. Cool. Thanks. That's good information. Uh, so kind of, I guess it's almost a little bit tangential, but it is to a Gen Five resources and an extent because it's mostly to do with the disk images, which I think, we're to say, are probably the most important Gen Five resources, as in they require the most work to create and to pass around. And I think the thing about disk images is they can kind of be anything you want, which is both a plus and a minus, because we kind of want to have some standardization here. And one of the big ways we want to standardize it is how exit events are handled. And exit events are ultimately annotations somewhere inside a disk image that are run, and then you return back to simulator. So on the Gem5 side, uh, in terms of actually modifying Gem5, uh, we're trying to get more kind of richer, more, uh, oh yeah, richer is probably a better word, exit events, because right now, Exit events are essentially just strings that are passed from the simulated system to to like Gen Five, and very little is changed or added from there on. Uh, you have to interpret this string and decide what you want to do. Um, so we're trying to make it this uh, object that was returned, and that object can convey richer information and richer functionality. Uh, I'm kind of currently working on that. I'm still flashing out some ideas there. I'm not entirely sure what's possible. Uh, my original idea was. Um, to have an object that would almost return vast quantities of information about your simulated system, but there's just limitations there. Um, but yeah, just kind of a enabling kind of um, richer information to be passed when uh, an exit event happens and uh, more functionality to kind of automatically handle these exit events. Uh, I'm working on that. I still kind of not entirely sure how it's going to end up, but it will be an improvement. Uh, and the other side of that is improving the disk images, which is actually a bit more fleshed out now. Uh, one of the big things, uh, I think, honestly, I would say about 40% of all the questions we get asked in the mailing list can be boiled down to, ultimately, how do I make a disk image for what I'm trying to do? Um, and so with that, we are creating, and this is, we, I say, kind of Herschel, essentially, as uh, creating new tooling tutorials and procedures for creating disk images. And basically just like, this is comes down to education and uh, everything else. We want people to have a very uh, clear outline of how you create a disk image to run in Gen 5. So, you know, uh, so obviously there's the, how to create a disk image itself, how to utilize cross compilers to do what you want to do, how to put the M5 utility uh, inside the disk image and how to utilize that correctly. 
so it's just something to point someone towards when they kind of ask these questions instead of just ask them to figure out, figure out themselves. Uh, and we also want uh, the discovery that we provide as Gen5 resources to have a kind of standardized uh, exit event. So you see everything we provide kind of has these standard uh, uh, exit events that always happen. So uh, I couldn't actually find Herschel your document before when like creating these slides where you outline what these exit events are. So I apologize this is slightly off, but I know one of them, every single disadvantage we, we, we provide will have an exit event after the kernel boot. Uh, and, and you don't have to do anything with this exit event. You can jump straight back into the simulation loop if you want, which I think a lot of people will, but it's there if you want to use it. And a uh, typical use case would be to creating a checkpoint there is useful, for example. Uh, I think one in login, but uh, and then workload end. I don't know why I didn't put workload begin there, but you can workload begin, workload end. Uh, just a, a predictable, standardized exit event. So when you download something from Gen5 resources, you can you don't have to modify your script that much. If you're wanting to jump from the uh, spec, isn't a good example because we can't distribute spec, but uh, the uh, gaps benchmark suite and the NAS parallel benchmark suite, you can uh, remove one disk image and put in another, and your hand, your exit event handling code can doesn't need to be changed if you just want to do roughly the same thing but with another benchmark because this exit events are standardized and uh, in standardized way in our benchmarks in our disk images. Uh, so Herschel's working on that. Um, and that's kind of I say this is a three pronged thing. The first is the top top the the top line there. We put in new tooling, tutorials, procedures. Second one is adding the uh, a standardized kind of exit events, and the third is just volume. We need more disk images for more ISAs and bundled into more suites. Uh, right now, I don't know what how many disk images do we distribute in Gen Five resources? Let's say like ten or something along like that order of magnitude. I think they're. I think 10 and 8 or 6, 7 or 8 of them are for uh, x86 using a very standardized, uh, very vanilla benchmark suites. And if anyone wants anything outside of that, it's up to them to create. So more ISAs, more targeting ARM, more tar more targeting RISC-5, uh, and just bundle these more into suites. Uh, that's just labor. So for instance, we do have the not, we do have something like the gaps, but gap suite. But and sorry, the gaps uh, suite inside a disk image, but we need to kind of bundle that into Gen5 suites so users can iterate through these various workloads, et cetera. Uh, again, that feeds into our multi processing work as well. So it's really just expanding and adding more there. Uh, Herschel, do you have anything you want to add there that I missed out that is crucial for this work? Um, no, I think you got everything that I can yeah. think of. I know you're, you're 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 spending a lot of time working on something I've kind of brushed over. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, that's kind of all I kind of roughly had just to say that what we're working on here. So we hope in the I would say weeks as a in the coming weeks will will be multiple new disk images provided with um kind of clear uh and suites and workloads that could be plugged into simulations and. Yeah, and yeah, tooling, etc. Uh definitely uh in the Gen 5 boot camp, I suspect we're gonna spend probably an afternoon getting people uh building disk images as part of their project because I just find this is something that is worth educating people on how to do in their project. Um yeah. Uh so I'm gonna push for that as part of the uh Gen 5 boot camp. Yeah, so that's what we've been working on, and that's really the last slide I had. Yep. Um, so does anyone have any input, questions, uh, comments? Yeah, for the, the disk images part, I noticed that there's, you know, there's one for gaps, hmm. and at least. Uh, have, have you considered instead just having, like, a base disk image for Ubuntu, you know, 22? Um, yeah, we've, I've, well, yes. Uh, Herschel, do you uh, do you have any like thing you want to jump into that before I just yeah well just yeah. to just to complete that thought there and then you have like a second disk image that has the actual benchmarks on it so if you wanted to run like NAS or something you would use the same yep. OS disk image and then NAS would be the second one 
it, it might save like rather than having a bunch of huge disk images, you used to have one common one and a bunch of smaller ones. Uh, Herschel, do you have a comment on that? Like, how are you doing? Yeah. So the plan is currently to have like a base, like Ubuntu generic disk image, and then build on top of that more specialized one. So let's say you have <clears throat> x86 Ubuntu 22.04, and then you have x86 Ubuntu 22.04 gaps, which is another, like a different disk image resource, which has the gaps. Five, is it like a, is it is it duplication like it's redundant right uh the gaps in, is in the sense that it will be built on top of the base disk image yes yeah yeah but it's like uh, yeah. is there a way to do something like reload and just like i don't know no i i did yeah I, I understand what you mean so but is there but if, if we want to update say to 24 or 4 and update our benchmark suites. Does that just mean creating X new benchmark suites each? Like how, how manual is that for us to do? Um, we can just, just spin up a new version of the suite, right? Version two or something with a new, the different, like version two of the suite referring to the new version of the disk image or something like that. And that should be pretty automatic on the but what do you uh, what do you mean by automatic? In the sense that you don't have to change the config script if you are not specifying the version. Oh no, I mean like by for creating these disk images. Um, in that, most likely I haven't tested with different i uh, like different Ubuntu versions, but most likely you can you just have to change the ISO file at least in the Packer config that I'm working on, and then uh, you well, can just uh, no no. My it. question is creating the disk images. Yeah. If I suddenly, if we've decided for every single benchmark we we like provide, we want to create one. We want users to be able to use twenty four oh four to twenty two oh four. How easy is that going to be for us to provide? I I have not tried it. I I I can't tell you that. I, I have not tried it. Do yet. we have to build a new disk image for every yeah. single one? Yes, most likely. Okay, that's yeah. So that is a lot of work then. There's no yeah. like, uh, or how, how automated can we make that? Um, ideally just one script run. That's what I'm trying to do. You just run, build, act, like build image and then it, that should build the image automatically. So I could just take the scripts you have and say, instead of the base image being 2204, the base image could be 2404 and we can quickly build out these disk images for people. Ideally, yes, that's what I want to do. Okay. So is there's... There's two problems here, um, or, or two different things. Well, one, th this wasn't really what Matt was asking. He he was asking, I'm, can you have two different disk images? One that just has the base of yeah. The... I I know what Matt was asking, but I think the answer to that is no. W why not? Well, yeah. Herschel's not made it that way. What? Herschel's not made it that way. Yeah, but what? Why? Why can't we do it that way? We can. Well, no. Herschel, the que the the question was, can we have a twenty two or four disk image that has all the OS with all OS features or whatever you need, and literally just have a secondary disk image which just has the gaps directory, nothing else, no wider OS features at all, and just load and somehow uh, maybe maybe this isn't right, like kind of dynamically link these two together inside the Gen 5 simulation to create the simulation that we need. Instead of having a 2204 image, okay, let, 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 let's, image plus the gaps, uh, the gaps. Let's take a step back here. There's um, two different ways we could do this. One is we could have multiple disks connected to Gen 5, which is feasible except there's significant limitations. Um, in x86, I think we can only have two. In other ISAs, I don't know if we can have multiple disk images or not. I've done up to three, by the way. On x86? Uh, yeah. How did you get the second? It, it's a little strange, but you just pass a Python list as the second disk image, and that somehow works. I don't understand the details 
I definitely thought the IDE controller we were using just had a master and a slave. Uh, anyway, okay, Yeah, that's it might cool. show up weird. There, there is, by the way, just kind of time to add, there's someone who created a PR recently that tries to implement multiple disk images in a standard library, but it's very, yeah, it's just a very, it's a rough draft for now, I guess. Um, So, yeah, so that's one way we could potentially do it. Um, I think that that doesn't solve the problem that you're talking about, Bobby, between 2204 and 2404, because we don't want to use binaries compiled with 2204 in 2404 because it, 2404 has a different compiler. And so Well, ye well, ye it has a different libc, and it's not going to link like yeah, it that's or. true. Uh, I, I guess, well, in this case, why would we would we ever? In which case, why why have this decoupling then? Is there any is there any argument for it? Yeah, I don't think you'd want to do that. Um, sort of where I'm coming from with my question, though, is from the GPU side. So, for example, PyTorch is like 10 gigabytes. So let's say you don't care about PyTorch. You would just have a base image that can run, um, you know, regular C++ GPU applications. And if you wanted PyTorch, you would mount the second disk image, which you can get separately. So you don't have to download some huge... Uh, I think it's at least 36 gigabytes disk image. You could just get a smaller Ubuntu only version. And then if you want PyTorch, you can get that later. That That's sort of where I'm coming from with this. It, it would save a lot of bandwidth too, in terms of gathering the resources. Uh, what's the argument of doing it that versus having two different disk images, one which is uh, without PyTorch, but with GPU and one with his, both GPU and PyTorch? Uh, I didn't think about that. That could work. I mean, I think that that's like, um, in some sense, it's more work for us because we have to create all these different disk images that might have a cross product of different things installed. Um, but I also worry a little bit about like allowing people to kind of combine different disk images and also the testing cross product that that will create. Yeah. Okay. I, I think the way I had the Packer script, at least for those set up, you can just sort of remove the parts that install the additional packages. Yeah, but I, I think your point is really well taken. Um, the other idea that I've been thinking is like, if we could do some kind of layered file system, kind of like what Docker does, uh, like use OverlayFS, where we have the base Ubuntu and then we overlay things on top of that. So you might want to overlay just Rockham in your GPU stack. And then on top of that, you can overlay PyTorch. And on top of that, you could overlay whatever PyTorch um, workload you want to run. Um, but right now, Gen5 doesn't support overlay OverlayFS. Yeah. Okay. I'm not familiar with that, but I'll look into it. It It's really cool. Um, but I, I it, it would take some engineering on the uh, Gen5 side. Well, so I think there's two things I can say. I think we should definitely enable multiple disk images uh, inside the standard library and allow for workloads to be set up with, with multiple disk images if required, which I think is a good step anyway. Uh, and from and once you've got that infrastructure down, we can distribute stuff like this for these certain use cases, if you wish. Uh, but I'd say right now we are creating, let's say these, um, let's say monolithic disk images. I don't know how I was going to describe it. They'll have everything very large, everything you need for your work. Uh, my fear that's kind of touched upon is, I think right now, uh, almost all our disk images are 1804 Ubuntu disk images, which is already makes me wince because that's getting, I don't know, end of life 1804 is next year. Is it this year or next year? Um, and uh, I really want to update everything to 2204, maybe 2404. Uh, and I want automation or that to be an easy step for us to do. So unfortunately, that's never going to be easy because Ubuntu just changes too much. It's going to take, I don't know, a day or two to figure out how to well, I would okay in the term over installing oh, and stuff. Uh... So for instance, like if we're using Packer, like the whole interface on how you initially install changed between 2004 and 2204. But I mean, like, is it okay? I mean, 
once we figure out the base image, how easy is it for us to create all the benchmarks on top of that? If they compile cleanly on the new operating yeah, system? Yeah, that, that, that's up to the benchmark but, suite creation yeah. people to make that well engineered. With right. I understand that inevitably will be problems with, oh, my, this benchmark doesn't compile with uh, GCC 10 or something. Understandable. But uh, I, assume, I assume if that's figured out, we, it is a button push, right? I know I've, I've, I've brushed aside a lot in that statement, but it should be. Right. Yeah, okay. I think so. <laughs> uh, if, I, if I think that's the best you can hope for. Yeah, and, and I think this is what, you know, one of the things that the value add of um, what we're doing is that we will do this work whenever a new version of Ubuntu comes out. So. I, was, I mean, we, we're very, I, I mean, so I don't, do we like, do people want something other than Ubuntu? Because we just went with it because Ubuntu is popular, <laughs> you know? But I don't know. Okay. Uh, anyone else have any other comments or questions or anything? Okay. Uh, I'm willing to cut this meeting. Well, we, we I, mean, I say cut this meeting short. I never think we need to use the whole hour if we don't need it. Um, so I was I might want to say uh next meeting does anyone have anything you want to talk about uh, uh talk about uh present literally anything these meetings are deliberately very open ended for anything gen five development related um otherwise we'll come up with something that we think is relatively worth talking about nope okay. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, as always, please reach out if you have any questions or comments. Uh, Ivana will put this recording on YouTube uh, for archival purposes. And uh, yeah, uh, same sex. Is it second Thursday of every month? Uh, yeah, we have the. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. the so second Thursday of next month, uh, we'll have the same thing again. And uh, yeah, please turn up, ask questions, be involved. And uh, yeah, I'll see you then. All right. All right, take care. Take care.